Welcome back everyone to the last bit of the uh, template series. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about mixing. So once you have all the MIDI tracks and general settings done, we get to the processing further down the line. Now you don't generally have a separate mixing template. Uh, I get that question a lot. Um, but no, there's, there's no time for that. There's no time to export all of your audio files and then you know, get them into a different template, do the mixing, and then send it out for client approval. That would be, that would be overkill. Um, and on a professional production, you usually don't have time for that. So the mixing has to happen right there and then in your DAW, in your writing template. So here you can see the Vienna Ensemble Pro outputs. If you remember, this is where all the instrument groups are coming out. As you can see, there's a general EQ applied to all of them. Doesn't matter which brand, I'm using the Isotope 8, I think, but it doesn't matter. FabFilter makes great EQs, or you can just use the EQ that comes with your DAW. I've used the Cubase internal EQ, and when I was on Logic, I also used the, the Logic EQ that comes with it. it. It doesn't matter. The better the EQ, or the, the more accurate it is, the better, but overall, it's fine. Just use whatever you have. Uh, if, if there's any takeaway from my videos, it should be make the stuff that you have work first before investing into something um, high-end. Now the EQing you see here is not very strong. It's just taking out bad frequencies, dirt, enhance the air on top a little bit, but it's very, very subtle. I want to kind of show you how to set it up instead of going through all of my settings because I'm worried that people are just going to copy my settings. I've refined these settings over years but they are really tailored to my writing style, to the libraries I use, to my routing, to uh, the sound that I like. Um, so it's very much, you know, I don't want people to see my EQing for violins and then go, oh, this is how you EQ violins. No, this is how I EQ violins for the exact libraries I have the way I have their volumes mixed and the way I blend them, and this is the EQ that I like, which doesn't mean it's the correct one. It's very much tailored to what mic positions I've used and all this kind of stuff. So I don't want people to think that this is how you EQ violins. There's no such thing as this is how you EQ this or that instrument, because it depends on how it was recorded and everything. So I'd rather make a separate video about EQing um, and just show you guys my limited knowledge of how to EQ. But so in general, I subscribe to, um, I think it's called subtractive EQing, where you basically take out frequencies that bother you instead of enhancing other stuff. At least that should always, I think, be the first step where you just take out all the crap. So normally the um, muddiness would, for example, sit somewhere between 300 and 500 hertz. So usually you want to clean up somewhere there or for example um, on any alto and soprano instruments you can really roll off the low end and just cut all of that out because you don't need those frequencies um, on the low brass very often you don't need the super low frequencies because you're going for the brassiness and not the bass frequencies because you have those in other instruments um, in strings, specifically sampled strings, you want to um, watch out for frequencies around 4K because usually you have a very nasty, uh, almost synthetic sounding frequency there that specifically in sampling, it just builds up for some reason. Um, you want to open up strings somewhere around 12 to 15K and just get that air and those harmonics in. Same with woodwinds, by the way, especially flutes. You know, there are so many things I can say about EQing. I'm just going to save that for, for a different video. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here forever. But so in general, if you want to know how to set up your EQ, I would say write a piece uh, or write something for a, a section, a whole section. And then um, the way you would find bad frequencies is by um, pulling up a frequency band, moving it around and seeing if there's anything that really bothers you. And then just take that out a little bit. Then you can also see I have a compressor on here. Um, it's the Waves Renaissance compressor. Again, you can use any compressor that is decent. 
doesn't matter. This is the one I like. It's not currently kicking in. It's not doing anything. Uh, I just have that on here in case I want to make something softer, not louder actually. So this is only for, um, usually I use it on percussion, you know, if I like a specific velocity in the percussion and I don't want to make that entire percussion group softer, um, then I usually have the compressor kick in a little bit so it pushes down the peaks, um, something like that. But I don't use these often. Um, panning, I usually leave as is. Sometimes I enhance it a little bit, especially in action cues, in very busy cues. I tend to, for example, pull the brass apart a little bit to, um, to make room for the woodwinds and for the strings and the percussion. So I tend to um, push the low brass and the trumpets a little bit to the right and then the horns a little bit further to the left. But normally I don't touch panning because you don't really need to. Um, because the instrument in any higher end library, they are already recorded um, sitting in the right position. So if you're using the, you know, Decca tree or full mix or something, the room mics, they should already have the instruments in the right spots. Then you want to set up reverb. In Cubase, you put them on FX tracks. In any other DAW, they're called aux channels again. Just use aux channels. I don't, I don't know why Cubase names it this way, but doesn't matter. Just load a bunch of effects tracks and load your reverbs. I would advise you to use two. Some people like to use, I don't know, 20. Um, bit overkill, I think, but if you're using really dry libraries, you'd probably need a lot of reverbs to create depth and, you know, do a lot of magic to make that work. But your regular libraries are already recorded, again, sitting in the right positions, so that's already done for you. So two reverbs, I think, is enough. <laughs> that's not go overboard. Um, why two? Well, one of them would be kind of a natural sounding reverb to create a room, to put everybody into the same room, especially when you're using different libraries that were recorded in different rooms. It's kind of nice to have them run into the same reverb unit to pretend they were all recorded in the same room. And then the second one is for color and for character. So as the natural sounding reverb, I use Lexicon PCM, which is somewhat expensive. Um, and then I use Valhalla Room for the um, color. And you can see that I'm using way less of that. It's not a natural sounding reverb, but it's very beautiful. And I would recommend anything from Valhalla DSP, really, because it's, it's really cheap. It's 50 bucks, you know? So uh, this is definitely the best bang for the buck out there, I think. I might do a separate video about reverb settings, but honestly, there is a really cool video uh, by Christian Hansen and uh, Jake Jackson, uh, where Jake goes over all kinds of like the most common software reverbs and kind of shows you how he would use them. So um, I would check that video out. There's also a bunch of videos by CineSamples where they show how they mix their libraries. I would check those out. There's a lot of stuff about EQing and reverbs in there, um, among others, these reverbs. Uh, and they are also in the video with Jake. So look up videos by score mixers and by sample library developers because they actually make a bunch of videos that go over this stuff. But so in general, um, my settings are, I've shortened the, the reverb tail of the lexicon to 1.8 seconds. Um, usually a uh, general concert hall reverb tail would be 1.8 to 2 seconds. And I rolled off the high end a little bit and I did something similar in Valhalla where I used the Bricasti preset and then I rolled off some more of the high end. And I think I also made the reverb tail a bit shorter. If you don't know how to set up your reverb, just go with the, you know, like natural concert hall preset and then work your way from there. It's always good. If you don't know how to use something, just work your way from a preset. Find a preset that you like and then just improve that over time and you're going to be okay.
So then what you're going to do once you have your reverb set up, um, you feed it via sends into the groups. Now I do it here with the Vienna outputs, but you can also do that later on. There are different stages at which you can add reverb, but it's, it's up to you. Um, I like to do it here. And you can see the values that I have um, are slightly different depending on the instruments. Some instruments just need more, some need less. Also, some libraries are a bit drier, some are a bit wetter, so I compensate for that here. Some people might be asking, why aren't you just loading all the reverbs onto these? Reverbs are very, very resource heavy. You don't want to do that. Um, I mean, if you can, go for it. But um, I also like that I can just adjust the reverb settings once and then it gets applied to everything because it's fed into the instruments via sends. If you did adjustments in and you had, you know, 20 different reverbs loaded, you would have to make that adjustment in all of the plugins and it's kind of time consuming. Um, these values, by the way, also are very specific to what I want. They are specific to the sound that I want. They are specific also to the routing that comes next because I have um, specific processing going on later that dries up the sound, so I can actually put more reverb on here. Um, so don't just take these values and think they are the values. They are not. You have to figure this out yourself. So then um, we get into the parallel compression. Um, I'll do a separate video also on compression, but in general, par what parallel compression does is you take the uncompressed signal, um, you duplicate that signal and compress it a lot. You would never naturally compress it that much. I can show you the, the settings that I have here. It's insanely compressed. And then you can mix the compressed signal into the uncompressed signal and it kind of beefs it up. It makes it sound bigger without making it sound compressed. It's To me, it's the most natural sounding compression because you don't hear the compression and you maintain the original signal and you just kind of, um, instead of with traditional compression, you cut off the top and then make it louder, you just leave it and then you kind of mix it in from below and thicken up the sound. And that's basically um, one of the secrets of the Hollywood sound, if you will. Um, that just makes everything a bit bigger than it normally would be. Be careful with this. Um, it can brighten up the sound, so you might want to apply an EQ. Um, so the way I have it set up here is I also feed the parallel compression into the groups via sends. Make sure it's set to post fader so that you can actually use the fader to mix in the compressed signal. Otherwise, you're going to have to use the send to mix in the signal. And I have it set up at minus six here, which is what I like. That's my default. I can obviously change it. Uh, if a cue needs more of it or less, then I can just move the faders. Um, again, this is not a rule or anything. This is just how I like it. Maybe you like more of it. Maybe you like less of it. Maybe your writing style or production style is different. Um, in which case, you know, adjust the stuff. Um, but this is how I have it set up by default before I write, this is what's happening. And by the way, and this is what I mentioned earlier, this compressed signal is a dry signal. So I am basically mixing in a dry signal, which dries up the sound, which means I can use more reverb in the earlier step. In Logic, I remember you can also do this. You do it slightly differently in Logic, um, because in Logic, you can actually send a signal into two aux channels at the same time. In Cubase, you cannot do that. Uh, the routing won't let you. But in Logic, you can just send the signal to two aux channels at the same time and then just compress one aux channel and then use that fader um, in the same way that I have the fader set up here. So it's actually a bit simpler in Logic than it is in Cubase, but okay, it is what it is. So then once we're done with this, um, the whole thing goes into my export groups. So it's another set of groups, aux channels, which I initially had them grouped up more into woodwinds high, woodwinds low, and so forth, but I've actually split them out recently because I just want them separated again. 
So now you have the compressed and uncompressed signal coming out of these. And now I can use these to export my stems. So if I go into the export menu, um, you can see that I can do the batch export, export multiple channels, go to these and export all of these at the same time offline. So basically exporting stems is now a question of a couple of mouse clicks. Um, sometimes if I need something exported extra, then, you know, I have a stems video actually that explains all of this. But so this is where what these groups are for. That's where all the process signal is coming out. Do note that these will be dry. If you want the reverb printed, you either have to print them onto audio tracks first and then take them from there. Or you can also print the uh, reverb onto separate tracks if you want to give the mixing engineer a reference or something. That's fine. So you can also route all of it, including the reverb, to audio, audio tracks and then hit record and play back the cue and just have it all recorded onto audio tracks right there. Then on the master fader, I have an instance of Ozone, sometimes also Magnetic 2, which I like. It's a tape saturator. Um, I mean, technically you can put anything onto the master fader. So I have an Ozone preset that I made for myself. The way I did it was just to go through different presets after I had written a bunch of cues and just find the presets that I like and then um, just go from there and experiment and figure out what features you want and all that stuff. So these are my presets. They don't do much by default. And by the end of a queue, I will get it to a certain loudness and everything. So when I deliver to a client, every queue is, you know, the same loudness and kind of sounds the same and went through the same processing. If there's something bothering me here, I can, you know, EQ the entire Q if there are some frequencies that don't work or, you know, I want some brightening up or some tape saturation or, you know, anything. That's what I do here. But I do that at the end of a queue. When I'm done writing, this is where I make some last minute adjustments. And then if I want those adjustments printed onto the stems, I'm going to have to copy that Ozone instance onto all of these group tracks. Beware of that. Ozone is very, very resource heavy. If you have a newer machine, you're, you should be able to do it. But, you know, sometimes you're going to have to do this in batches. Be sure to not send your mixing engineer brick walled, you know, stems. Like if you push the volume in this a lot, maybe ease up on it a little bit. You don't want fully, you know, mastered stems to go to your mixer because, I mean, leave them some headroom. But if there's specific processing in here that you want on there, then by all means, do print it on there. Normally, mixing engineers do want stems that sound very, very close to your ref mix so that they don't have to redo everything that you've already done and do an approximation of what you've done. You know, you can already give them your premix. Yeah, so this is um, all the mixing I have going on, um, all the pre-mixing. So when I'm writing, things are already basically EQ'd and, you know, go through a bunch of processing. Um, I don't apply that later, but I will adjust it later. So this is not something that is immovable or anything. And anything else I want, I also add to the piece when it's written. Uh, if there's a specific reverb I want for a piece or a specific instrument, I'm just going to add that. And if there are, like I have a lot of sound toys stuff that I like to use and a bunch of other things that if I want them or I need them for something, I will load them, but they're not in my template. Because not everything needs to be in my template. This is just the basic blank session that I work off of when I start. And then things get added as I write on a project. I hope this was helpful. Um, there are as many templates as there are composers, as I said before, um, and they are, they are always in development. So this is only one way to go. This is the way it works best for me, but not necessarily the best way it works for everyone. For you, it might be something entirely different. I have simplified my template over time. It used to be much more complicated, which, with much more instruments loaded and much more audio 
processing going on, much more, you know, audio plugins loaded and all this stuff. But yeah, I've, I've downsized it a lot over time. I've uncluttered it and just reduced it to the things that I really, really want, really need, that I really use all the time. You know, you can see that you don't need a million audio plugins um, or every sample library on the market loaded to be a professional composer. Again, I want this to be the takeaway of my library videos and my template video. Just have one good thing of everything and you're gonna be fine and then you can add to it, but you don't need the um, $50,000, you know, sample load and audio plugin load in order to be a professional. You just don't. That's just a myth and you see all these people always buying the latest thing that came onto the market and I'm just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really not necessary. So um, that should be the takeaway here. You can get a professional template and a professional sound with not actually that much stuff.